Okay, so this is this is my way to tell the heading for Extinction Talk. And bad luck, folks. I seem to have 85 slides here, which is clearly an impossibility in an, in an hour. So it's basically the greenhouse effect. has been understood for many years. The original scientists behind this included some female scientists, actually, back in the 1800s. It's not complicated. You heat the earth up when you put certain molecules, carbon-containing uh, molecules, in the atmosphere. And it's been well established, the science of climate change, actually by the oil company. Is. But instead of doing something about it, they spent an awful lot of money on the climate denial industry. They learned how to do climate denial through the tobacco industries. The tobacco industries said, ooh, there seems to be a problem, so let's have more research. That was the tactic. We'll have more research and we'll sow various seeds out there. You know, you, they still circulate. What about India? What about China? Just things that are ways to push back to not have to think about this thing. It's worth bearing in mind that fossil fuels are subsidised globally. They're actually subsidised by five trillion dollars. So when people say there's no money for sorting out climate change, there, there, there's some money for you. And actually, unfortunately, the UK leads the EU in subsidising fossil fuels. So we subsidise them to, to the tune of 12 billion compared to only 8.3 on renewables. And if you compare that to Germany, you can see the, the, the sort of opposite direction there and, and much more on renewables. So um, when the UK talks about leading on climate change, that's how much bullshit that is, basically. Um, and the subsidies are the same as 2008. So the Overton wind has changed, you know, the public discourse has changed, and Extinction Rebellion's contributed to that opening of that, of that window, um, but actual action hasn't matched. You know, we haven't won yet, fundamentally. The consequences of climate change are here. Uh, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that die across, across the globe due to climate-related deaths, and it includes people in this country dying of uh, air pollution, which gets worse under climate change. And that figure will aim into the billions. I don't know if anybody saw Roger Hallam's Hard Talk interview. It's a bit marmite, isn't it? I loved it personally, but I love Roger. You know, it's like being battered on the head, isn't it? Uh, and there's this, this thing about whether it's six billion or not. I mean, what a perverse discussion. Is it six or four? Get your science hacking. I mean, it's fucking billions of people, right? Do you know? Do, uh, do we need to, do we need a, you know, error bars on it? It's just enough to know it's a lot of people. And his job is to be emotional in the press. Yeah, there are many consequences of climate change already here. The, the impacts are being felt right now, the majority in the, in the global south. And the fact that we haven't taken care of that means it's coming home as an intergenerational issue. We're leaving this issue for our children to deal with. And it's now, it's happening now. It's, we're moving into that time. So next slide. Those with the least responsibility for this have suffered the most. You know, the Syrian uh, war had a strong um, element to do with climate change. Some parts of the world are going to go underwater and they need to be rehoused. And that's where Polly Higgins' law, this, the law of ecocide, also less known to people, includes that when there's been mass damage and destruction and ecocide and effects of climate change that people should be repatriated and taken care of. The impacts were felt in the UK already uh, last year. Well, gosh, I should have updated this slide. You know, this year, the hottest summer on record. Uh, and you see increased effects in, in, in hospitals. And, and, and we had times when there was big downfalls of rain. So it, it, it's all here, folks, right? So I've skipped over to the one with the woman pulling her hair out. I, and I just always think it's quite useful to own this piece. You know, I've been an environmental activist for many years, uh, also a, a social and eco environmental justice, sorry, uh, economic justice activist. And with this issue of the ecological crisis, there was still a part of me, quite a strong part of me, that was hoping somehow, in a quite a numbed out way, that it was a crisis that somebody else, somewhere else, was going to have to deal with at some other time. Do you know what I mean? And like you're stressed and it's easy to have your head in the sand and you're sort of enjoying the summer anyway. And I still have this feeling sometimes. And that's what we're up against, is that part of ourselves that just doesn't want to face this. And that's been shifting. And part of the shift is the big initiation that humanity is going through right now. And in a lot of ways, the Extinction Rebellion is the leading edge of that. It's a meltdown. It's a meltdown, of an emotional meltdown. And I'm so grateful to those of you here that are leading grief work and 
any kind of work to help us process emotions and, and, and really I was just talking to one of the brothers out the back there about how this stuff can feel and women, you know, female bodied people tend to have been given more opportunity to feel feelings and I really want to send up a prayer and love to brothers to find each other and find ways to be able to process this grief, it's really important work so this, this information, this talk can lead to these things but relief can also be part of it that finally this thing's getting named so all emotions are welcome uh, I have a background in science so I'm on the precautionary principle slide uh, I did a PhD some years ago in postdoctoral research in molecular biophysics so I know something about the scientific process and, and, and essentially when you're looking at science there's the difference between what a scientist is going to say down the pub it's quite important what they say you know, people know Jen Bendel's paper Deep Adaptation Yeah, 500,000 downloads that's had it's the most downloaded academic paper ever and it's a generalist, he's a generalist, he's, he's surveyed the piece and his estimation, I'll cut the slide on this later, but his estimation is that probably within the next 10 years we'll have social collapse. He thinks it's inevitable whenever it's coming. Uh, and after he launched that paper, he had four climate scientists contact them, him. And one of them was uh, Peter Wadhams, who's into the cryosphere and was given a bit more information about the ice. And the other three said, um, Gem, it's a brilliant paper, but, you know, it's not really hard-hitting enough. Uh -huh. and, and it's those opinions that, that scientists can't necessarily back that up. You know, those opinions down the pub. A single paper is useful, and it might have inaccuracies in it until it's been checked against a review of a specific area. And then the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, they review reviews, and they only include things that are there's consensus around. And so there isn't much consensus around methane and various tipping points. So the IPCC is generally going to be inaccurate, actually. It's going to be, and, and the graphs you can see. I mean, there was one thing with the IPCC whereby they said that they were predicting from their models a certain sea level rise. And the sea level had already risen 70% more than their models. <laughs> you know, So it's great that the IPCC last year was sounding an alarm about this time last year. But their alarm bells just aren't loud enough. They weren't soon enough. Um, and actually their third panel includes economists and policy makers and they try to say what what this paradigm, this business as usual situation wants to hear. So what we try and do in this talk is use key papers uh, to back us up. Um, and we are wanting people to uh, raise an alarm. So with this talk, we want to face and understand the crisis and we want to talk about what we want to do about it. So facing and understanding the crisis. I'm on the slide with the earth on it. The, the Earth's our only support system and we're destroying it, right? We're destroying its climate, its ecology, uh, and our future. And greenhouse gas emissions are rocketing ever since the um, IPCC uh, started back in 1990, emissions have gone up by 60%. That's how much effect our green movements had to date. And that's how much the idea that, you know, green capitalism is going to save us, that's how, how successful that's been. Uh, global temperatures are skyrocketing as, as well. We think it's about 1.1 above what the pre-industrial age. That's about the global uh, average temperature. It always sounds like a little bit, doesn't it? One degree, but it's the impacts that that has. So um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said we had to limit warming to one and a half degrees of uh, centigrade, and that requires drastic action. Um, so I'm on the slide with the little funny thermometer thing um, and clicking through that. So basically, uh, that's what we're supposed to do. It, and and, and, and recognise that four degrees of cooling is an ice age. So when we start talking about temperature changes around four degrees, we're talking about massive shifts that are unprecedented, that life on Earth is not adapted to dealing with. Well, what the current science says, and this is a paper uh, from Nature, you can tell the, the credentials of the paper based on where it's published. If it's in Nature, it's about as good as it gets, right? Nature or science. Only 1% chance that we can hit the Paris climate change agreements because lots of warming's already baked in. Once we tackle air pollution, uh, we'll get about half a degree of warming because it's um, scattering heat, all the, all the shit in the atmosphere, unfortunately. There's only a 5% chance it'll be less than 2 degrees C. They're talking about the likely range being between 2 and 5 and um, certainly talking above 4. 
uh, you know, you know how we say it in XR, we're fucked uh, if we carry on as doing what we're doing. So there are things called tipping points and feedback loops in the jargon and uh, amplifiers is it maybe a general term. As, so basically, as the planet heats, ice melts, ice reflects uh, sunlight out into the atmosphere, and um, then the dark sea absorbs more heat. It's called the albedo effect, and it basically means that um, heating speeds up. You might have seen Sir David Attenborough's film, where he shows you some of the methane clathrates that are stored in the ice as well. Methane's a far worse greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, and when these uh, white, you can see these white bubbles of methane, when they release, they trigger um, a, a runaway climate change. Potentially, it's called the methane dragon. Next slide. So these um, multiple feedback points, tipping points, and so on, can c combine to tip the Earth into a new state, into what was called the hothouse Earth in a paper that came out last year. And at various temperatures, you get various effects. So by three degrees of warming, the Amazon forest has burnt down. And uh, I can't say that without, you know, looking at what's already happening when you have fascists running countries. Uh, and forests burn down more quickly when you have deforestation happening because you leave like piles of trees around kindling, right? So this is some of these papers are only looking at climate change. They're not looking at biodiversity loss as well. They're not looking at what happens politically when you get idiots in charge. Um, you get increased melting of like the Greenland ice sheet and so on. So net carbon sinks become carbon emitters. Uh, we're already in the situation that the coral reefs are, ble are bleaching and so on. So next slide. The uh, melting of ice in Greenland, and again, papers this year show that that's going a lot faster than thought it would do, is associated with sea level rises, and two-thirds of the world's main cities are on either coasts or uh, on, on rivers or places that tend to flood because you want to be near water, right? You also have power plants. They have nuclear power stations, things like that. So that's why it's in Jen Bendel's deep adaptation paper that we need to take care of nuclear power stations. We need to be ready to do that. You know, society collapses and then meanwhile the nuclear power station is going to melt down. Cheery stuff, folks. <laughs> You're all right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, so basically, migration will soar. Uh, some estimates talk about 140 million people on the move, another one in nine people on the move. There's some unprecedented amount of forced displacement. And I think in, in Britain, next slide, we tend to think as an island nation and uh, I, I, I have a, you know my dad was a minor right I, I really hate the way we talk about racism as if it's something that working class people do on their own and like we definitely do but uh, it's it's you know it's universal and uh, part of it is is not really wanting to think about these things you know just trying to put a veneer over the top of it the UK will be flooded and that picture of the UK is in you know, many centuries time if, if the sea levels rise the way they could do. And I think there's something to call in here about the love of these lands. Is that what we want to happen to this beautiful place that we live in? But by 2050, 10% of the UK population will be affected by um, ongoing or uh, permanent flooding, uh, both rurally and in, in, in cities. And that means we'll have an internal pressure, even if you can manage to keep out, let's face it, all the brown folks, you know, and let them drown in the sea. We've still got an issue. So that's only half of the problem. We're also destroying the planet's ecology. I'm on the slide uh, looking at both the oceans and the land and moving on. We've got this high-intensity agriculture. It's replaced wilderness. Uh, we have other ecological pressures. The, the, the evil twin of climate change is seen as um, ocean acidification. A lot of the carbon dioxide has been absorbed into the ocean so far, and it creates carbonic acid. And the more acidic the oceans become, then the sea creatures can't make their shells, and that's where carbon gets stored. So basically, the lungs of the earth are the oceans, even more than the forests. And we're killing the oceans off with the ocean acidification issue. Uh, we know, next slide, about the pollution of air, soil, and water from particulates, plastics, and chemicals. 
and um, that we're depleting water at, at a great rate. And you look at that map, you know, it's kind of not Britain. We've, we've got loads of water here, so maybe we're all right. You know, it's that island mentality again, but actually that's where your food comes from, folks. Um, one of the issues on there is um, in Bangladesh, so much water has been removed from their aquifers to make fast fashion, as well as the carbon footprint of fast fashion. Uh, soil erosion, you know, Michael Gove said that we're 30 to 40 years away from a fundamental loss of fertility. We keep throwing fossil fuels onto the soil, it emits uh, carbon, uh, it messes with the nitrogen cycle, and uh, it depletes. It's just not the way we need to farm. <laughs> This is one of the great hope. Anyway, I'll get more hopeful in a bit. <laughs> Deforestation and habitat loss are mentioned already. And um, yeah, it just. Um, I always look at this slide and think about what it means when I pop down the Tesco and get a load of biscuits for the palm oil to keep me going. Did any, uh, just me do that? <laughs> Anybody else with the. Good for you people who've uh, sorted out your palm oil addictions. Um, I don't do it often, by the way. I usually get the ones with butter in and then have a vegan crisis about it. You, know? <laughs> you can't win, can you, when you're full of addictions and shit and trauma. You just um, do your best. Um, let's not shame and blame each other. Um, yeah. Some vegans with the Oreo biscuits, it's their fault. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> so, um, there have been five major extinction events in the past. Um, I'm on that slide. Are you keeping up there at the back? Is it, you're doing a fantastic job, thank you. The, the last one we know about, more often we talk about the one with the dinosaurs, and that actually, even though it was an asteroid, had uh, carbon dioxide as part of its process. The Permian-Triassic extinction was a massive runaway climate change uh, in which all the methane got released, and then there was such a massive die-off that there was loads of hydrogen sulfide released. And um, like so basically everybody dies, and it all smells of rotten eggs, and 97% of all life got wiped out. And uh, potentially we're on that pathway at the minute. We know the mechanism by which uh, we wipe out most life on Earth. I, I understand that the heating and the carbon dioxide releases are, are on a par with the Permian mass extinction. So we're, we're known to be in the Earth's sixth mass extinction caused by people this time. A million species at risk. Next slide where, you know, you've got... Um, Scientists using phrases like biological annihilation. This is not just climate change, this is habitat destruction, invasion by alien species, and overhunting and pollution as well. And it's the overconsumption, especially by rich folks, you know. So, as much as we don't focus on personal change in Extinction Rebellion, because we know that the change has to come politically, and we don't want to sort of turn into yet another consumer sort of driven thing that stays within this paradigm, it is also worth noting that. 50% of emissions are created by 10% of the population. Uh, this is Kevin Anderson's figures. And if, if people would reduce their carbon footprint to that of the average European, so we're not talking hair shirts here, uh, and even better if we'd go back to the 1970s, right? But that of the average European, carbon emissions would go down by a third. So what that means is if we, if we had a serious wartime economy, what happens in a war is that the rich have to stop behaving like rich people with too much money and jet jetting around, you know, to give up some of the privileges. That'd be like the first thing that would happen. And uh, I think Greta Thunberg really named it well, actually, that you don't have that many celebrities and known scientists that speak out because they have this carbon footprint and they know that they're in deep hypocrisy, actually. And I actually honour the ones, you know, Eileen Getty's getting a little bit of a toasting in the Times. We've had some funding from her uh, recently, her family. And uh, yeah, she flies, you know, she knows she needs to stop, I guess. She's getting around to it. But the, 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 po the point I'm making is that the people that are actually willing to be named as hypocrites, I, I actually honour them. I also ask them, all of us, to, to make changes in our behaviour. It's, um, it's, a, it's a path, isn't it? So, uh, just clicking through the bullet points there, um, we know that one in four mammals, one in eight birds, a third of all amphibians, and 70% of the world's plants are at risk. And a study in 2017 named the insect apocalypse, a 75% decline in flying insects. And there's this conversation, right, about the fact that some of us, you know, as the younger you are, you just haven't seen what it was like when you used to drive down the road and your windscreen was covered in insects, you know. 
it, it, it's in my uh, I've got a, I keep saying it, I've got a sparrow's wing here it's just I think it's all right in the west country isn't it it's like normal behavior in Stroud to pull the wings off dead animals and make jewelry out of it <laughs> um anyway it's because I love sparrows it's not because I'm mean she, she's definitely dead um <laughs> there was um there's been a 50% decline in, I think it's 60% in sparrows, 50% decline in hedgehogs. I had a hedgehog in my garden the other night because I'm rewilding it, as in I can't be asked to, to take care of it. <laughs> it's great. It just shows you what nature would do. You know this whole thing, you don't actually get any money for planting, for, for rewilding. Just let nature do it because she knows what she's doing. You know, plant tree, HS2, can we talk about HS2? HS2 planted all these trees and they all fucking died, you know, because it watered them. Like, ne leave it alone in the first case, if it's good. And then, you know, let nature rewild itself. Give it back, you know. But there's no money for that at the minute. These are the things that just have to change. It could be done really quickly. Phoenix has got his hand up. I, I wouldn't normally think if somebody's got their hand up, they're probably a conspiracy loom who wants to ask me about 5G. But even if it's <laughs> Phoenix, <laughs> sorry, I will talk about 5G. If we want to... Just a very quick fact which you all be aware of. If HS2 goes ahead, it is the biggest destruction of uh, trees and biodiversity or trees since World War One. That means more trees we chopped down by HS2 than all the trees we chopped down in World War Two. So just if you think about that, defending the biodiversity of all those 85 yep. ancient forests that by I'm actually in a meeting on Monday with some of the HS2 folks. Um, yeah, I'm definitely up for uh, some action there. Um, and there's a brilliant video by Jonathan Pye. It's essentially like a, a airport, an airport shuttle service, HS2. You know, all that money could be spent upgrading the railways. It's absolute madness. Um, just, just going back to the slides, one in five British mammals could be extinct within a decade. So you had, you know, you've got the equivalent of the IPCC for uh, biodiversity and losses, the IPBES. So we have these incredible bodies, massive agreement across the world. And as Caroline Lucas said something, I'm paraphrasing her, will be the species most on the data, understanding its own decline. You know, just on the data all the time. Um, but it's, it is important when you have these bodies. And, that, and that's really the point, you know, Extinction Rebellion focuses on the key bits of science where the, where the absolute uh, understanding of the issues is, is so concrete. There's no, there's no debate to be had. I mean, there's probably marginal, around the edges conversations, but, you know, the, the, the facts are there. Um, there are 75,000 chemicals that have been made by people that are in our envi environment. We only know 5,000 of them are safe. So 70,000 aren't known whether they're safe or not. So if anybody wants to bring up a single issue, you got to put it in the context of that. There are many, many single issues out there. Glyphosates, bronated phthalates, overuse of antibiotics, glyphosate, you know, um, cadmium from insulin. There's lots out there. So that's why I'm not into single issues. I don't mean they're not important, but that's not what XR is about. So, um, you know, all these beautiful creatures that we love uh, were unlikely to pass the majority of them on to our descendants. And, but the madness of it, of course, is that you're standing on a branch and sawing it off. And there's something about the disconnect of our society that makes us think that, you know, those biscuits are always going to be there in Tesco's. Like, it's really, really stretched thin. The delivery system of capitalism is maximised for efficiency, as in it's like a stretched a rubber band, stretched to the maximum. Just a little bit more stretch and it breaks. To the possibility of human extinction slide, there was a paper in PNAS, that's the Procedures National Academies of Sciences, again, another good journal, uh, which gave a 1 in 20 uh, chance that the carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere could create an existential warning threat. So, you know, the paper's quite technical, and you can get a little bit bothered with the technicalities of it, but fundamentally, here's what the scientist said to the journalist, the, the sort of dra down the pub comment, is that it's equivalent to a 1 in 20 chance that the plane you're about to board will crash. We'd never get on that plane right, but we're willing to send our children and grandchildren on that plane. And I think the other thing about that is that, you know, we um, this paper's just on temperature. It, it's not looking at all the other issues that we've got in the room. So the David Wallace Wells book came out recently, and, the, the, you know, the point, we're increasingly talking to the elite, 
and to uh, I've been asked to talk to financiers by the FT in the autumn and as well as saying hey look guys you, you've got kids as well you know the point is uh, to say they're all men uh, the point is that this system's going to kill itself it's going it's going down it's it's going to collapse for every degree of warming one percent decline in economic growth it's probably worse than that because it's probably not linear effects actually for every degree of warming crop yields down by 10 percent but then also drought effects kick in and the world can't produce the calories needed at two and a half degrees c and anyway the nourishment in food's dropping as well so the end of century projections population to grow by 50 percent food production to half you know it's a recipe for a disaster we know from people like colin tudge we can feed nine million people we change our farming systems and we don't we stop wasting food that's one of the biggest footprints is the waste of food so last summer the lithuanian government declared a state of emergency in latvia their harvest and natural disaster the kind of collapse of food systems is happening already it was just onions in the uk uh, and obviously we import onions so we you wouldn't have noticed that yet but what the academics talk about is multi breadbasket failure it's when food systems collapse in different bits of the world, one place due to drought, one place desertification, you know, another place flooding. That's when the shit hits the fan. And we know that food shortages are what trigger social collapse. There's just massive amounts of evidence of that. And at those times, that's when fascism rises up, right? And there are 14 indicators of fascism, and they're already here. They're already in the room. It's about increased militarism, increased sexism, increased racism, and so on. It's, it, you know, fascism isn't going to look like people in like Hitler uniforms doing funny walks, unless they're like fetishists <laughs> down <laughs> cellar or something. <laughs> but you know, generally, it's going to look like what's already happening. So Professor Shell Nuber forwarded um, a paper called What Lies Beneath, which was the understatement of existential climate risk. So the point, the point of sharing this when he says climate change is now reaching the end game, the issue is the very survival of our civilization. You know, the point of sharing that is that we're, we're, we're saying this is why we're picking out these bits of science, because it's been understated. Next slide. Uh, and so um, Sir so David Attenborough um, making this comment, if we just play that video. Right now, we are facing a man-made disaster of global scale. Our greatest threat in thousands of years, climate change. If we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. So the next slide's Jem Bendel, but I've spoke about that quite a bit. So, um, yeah, basically from his estimation, inevitable social collapse, immense catastrophe, very likely, and human extinction a possibility. And uh, that's one of, the, one of those three climate scientists feeding back at the bottom, but just to pick out a piece, he's saying that they're not really focused on these really high-risk events, uh, uh, high-risk temperatures. And um, this Dr. Nor is in his estimation is that the whole of climate science profession has let down humanity it's a big thing to say actually it's this sort of inherent conservatism in the climate so in in in, in scientific fields they need to be generally um anyway um so the un secretary general said that if we don't change course by 2020 we risk missing the point where we can avoid runaway climate change we, it's so impossible to know the truth of these dates actually but this is based on the ipcc and we, we know it's pretty failed so in that way whenever anybody's talking about carbon budgets it's just a nonsense we're at 410 plus parts per million we should be at 273.50 so we, there is no carbon budget left right it's it's already spent and we'll just play that um video every day i'm faced with the challenges of our troubled and complex world but none of them loom so large as climate change if we fail to meet the challenge all our other challenges will just become greater and threaten to swallow us climate change is quite simply an existential threat for most life on the planet, including and especially the life of humankind. Government policy uh, at its best is rearranging the chairs on the deck chair and kicking the ball into the long grass. And that's it. It's actually issuing new oil and gas licenses at the minute. 
uh, we have the infrastructure bill that says that fossil fuels have to be optimised. There's a new coal mine being opened in Cumbria. Uh, not if the Cumbrian XR people have anything to do about it. And I met them recently. They're fucking awesome. So uh, this is an absolute zombie economic uh, technology. It's ridiculous fracking. And, and still they carry on. And the tremors that are happening in Blackpool, you know, hopefully that's going to get killed off at some point soon. It's ridiculous. Uh, HS2 we've mentioned and the arms fair this brilliant uh, thing this week with the resistance at Dicey at the arms fair I mean, you know it's a massive um, carbon footprint the military as well so all these things that carry on um, so th there has been no concrete action skipping over that slide and uh, so I just I, th I think this blog by Douglas Rushkoff really had a lot to say to me so he, he's the professor of media theory and digital economics at, at New York um, State University. And he got invited to uh, to speak at a resort. Of, of He often does, apparently, investment bankers. They want to know, you know, should we invest in AI or, you know, robotics or whatever. I don't know the difference is. Um, Web3, I don't know. So talk about the future tech. It gives, get, this guy gets given half his salary for this presentation. But actually, it was just five billionaire hedge fund managers that were brought into the room. That's all that wanted to speak to him. And what they wanted to know was about the coming climate crisis. Where was safe to go? Was it New Zealand or Alaska? One of them had just finished building a bunker and wanted to know how to maintain authority over the guards at the bunker. After what the rich call the event. It's called the event. They know it's coming. I'm not trying to other rich people, by the way. I mean, we're one family, uh, and this is based in so much despair, right? Uh, so the event is, the, 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 it's going to, the collapse is coming. It could be for a financial crisis, health crisis, or whatever, a climate crisis. How do I maintain authority, wanted to know. Should, should, should he have electric collars on the guards that electrocuted them? Or, 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 would the, or would the robots be ready to maintain uh, who wants? Do you want to live in a bunker? I don't want to live in a bunker. I'm, I'm, I'm going down like you know, fighting as a heart-based warrior. You know, I don't want to live in a bunker. A few tins of beans. Uh, anyway, I, I cheerfully think about natural, natural suicide, henbane, and, uh, and and all of that. But that might be because there's dementia in my family. But uh, you know, I don't know. It's funny. There's, there's something about getting over yourself in terms of being stressed about this thing and, and living in purpose. I, I, yay! yay. 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 I, 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 it's nice to hear that some people have done that journey. If you're on that journey where you're, having, you're in a meltdown, you're crying a lot, and, and it does come and go, by the way, uh, or I always say be with other people with it. Don't do it on your own. And, 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 and there is something out the other side because your heart breaks over and you feel courageous and you feel like, I don't give a fuck anymore, <laughs> literally. And I kind of know what's coming in a way. You know, when the Daily Mail went to my mum's house recently, my sister's house, I just kind of knew that sort of shit would happen. So I was just like, all oh, right, that's happening now. You know, the policy exchange report, there was attack on many of us, but especially Roger and I, it's opening the ground for, um, for violence, to be honest, is the way I read that. I, did, I was in with the BBC senior people and I said, you know, when you present that, present us as extremists, you do know you put my life in danger. You know, just think about that. Joe Cox, you know, what happens with the radical right are told these people are extremists. But, you know, can I just be frank with you? Fuck it, I don't give a fuck. In, in the sense of... <laughs> and I'm not calling it in spiritually, but it's just... Uh, like, you just have to not... That's not where the focus needs to be. It's focus on the purpose and sorting this thing out. So maybe we can skip over Kate Marvel to tell us we need courage, not hope. It was on the other video. So here's the, the Banksy that arrived at Marble Arch. From this moment, despair ends and tactics begin. And uh, Charles Eisenstein recently said every trans... Every moment of transition has a moment of despair beforehand. And so if you're sitting in that, that's part of the initiation into these times. Daniel Pinchbeck has written a book that the transformation of human consciousness into what it needs to be will be lifted up 
by a, a grief uh, faced on a, a, an ecological crisis. So, so what do we need to do about this? Well, you know, there is so much that we can do. Uh, there is, uh, so David King's opening a new centre, by the way. He was a former uh, government scientist in the Blair years. Don't hold that against him, I suppose. But, um, <laughs> uh, and it's for climate repair. And he is looking at geoengineering, by the way. And uh, XR takes no positions on any solutions. That absolutely has to be the case. I personally, my personal view is that we should be open-minded to any potential solutions, but not if they are, there's no precautionary principle and not if they're to, in order to justify business as usual, right? Uh, in Jen Bendel's paper, he talks about cloud brightening over the Arctic as, a, as a, an emergency um, response to the mountain, the ice. So so, you know, I, I just don't know enough to give you a, a reasonable answer as to whether geoengineering is a good idea or not. And I, I'm sure it's... A, but, but, but there are some people that are going to be looking into it. And I, I was reassured by David King that precautionary principle will be at the heart of it. Fundamentally, though, you know, what speaks to me is nature, you know, is solving the other crises. You know, geoengineering doesn't solve the biodiversity crisis, right? Uh, having more animals and plants around does. And guess what? They're made of carbon, you know, they are carbon stores. So um, regenerative agriculture rewilds in and uh, reimagining how we do things that, that you know, that, that there are things you can do with the oceans and so on uh, in, in terms of making areas, places where you can't do fishing and that kind of thing. So we know how to sort this out. And, and, and it's not to say there's some utopia around the corner. It's not to say that there won't be massive loss anyway because of what we've already done. But I absolutely believe that in humanity's ingenuity, in what we can do when we come together, and that's what it's about for me, is coming together, is... is being together and being absolutely determined to make this to make this work and i think that's the spirit uh for the young people actually it's my view of it i don't know it's right but that the older folks are opening the door the young people storm through and say we're fucking sick of this we're not having it and uh, get organized and, and we repair this you know there literally is you know people are like where are we where are we going to live you know because the, the mortgage let's stop paying our mortgages you know that's one of the things i'm focused on for the autumn is a mass debt refusal why are we paying our we're fucking paying our mortgages to these folks you know it's madness where, where are we going to live well last april we did a mass trespass on the bathurst estate we should we just stay should we just move in with hector <laughs> <laughs> do you mind hector he's a pretty good dude actually but you know you know we can just uh, have it back you know it's ours anyway do you see what I mean? If we trust each other and we're together, there, is, there are no barriers. You know, the, the barrier is patriarchy, which is scarcity, separation and powerlessness. And the, 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 the way we tackle that is by being willing to be vulnerable, by mourning for what we've lost and by tenderness for each other. And then by coming together in mass civil disobedience. And we, essentially, disobedience is not going along with the stupid thing that's happening. You know, it's not all it is, and it's also initiatory. And as much as we don't expect everybody to get arrested, that's not the situation. There is no policy thou shall get arrested. There is a hero's journey for the people that make that choice. To do. Who's been arrested here? Anybody? Thank you. Thank you. Ah, oh, you're on one of the videos. Nice to see you, babe. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, anybody else find it a slightly sexual experience? Or is that just me? <laughs> Good. Stuart, we'll talk later. I got, this, <laughs> I got this picture of this young guy arresting me. Literally looks 12. <laughs> I, I, should, I haven't got it on the story. I should show it you. But I'm like... Um, it was at this incinerator site, and I said to him... Um, he's halfway through his spiel that they give you, and I goes like, Babe, is this your first time? <laughs> And there's a, you know, the guy, I thought, is he even doing fucking work experience or something? You know? <laughs> and there's, there's a guy within the older place, shush, 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 and I said, because it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to get those handcuffs out? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't actually say that, I was thinking it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> oh, it, right, skipping over to moral obligations to act. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you stop this when you could? Said the young ones to their parents. Because we were too busy fucking messing about and not getting on it. Uh, you know, once the herd's turned, the momentum's there. And are you feeling that? Yeah. You know, it's magic. You know, I have a pagan practice, so I sort of believe, even though I'm a scientist, believe in like odd things. 
the, the, things are lining up for us all this time. This whole thing with the general election and all of that. Do you know what I mean? Every time we've done something, it's felt like things have lined up for us beautifully. And my, you know, the, the political team are discussing this at the minute, but my personal sort of advice and view is like, let's just, because actually Extinction Rebellion is really about democracy, failed democracy, failed economic system, failed media. You know, you know my personal opinion is like, just fuck it, just like, let's take over democracy this autumn, actually. Take over Parliament. So I'm just going to massively skip over these slides that, we, you know, we've tried everything, we've tried all these summits, we've tried, you know, all the usual campaigning approaches and so on. And what I really want to say right now, by the way, is that there are elders in this movement. If you, uh, who, who's been an environmentalist for more than like, let's say 10 years? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Come on. There are elders, folks, right? <laughs> you know, sometimes I like, have to say a bit, I like cringe a little bit. I hear um, Extinction Rebellion people sometimes going, you know, we're here, we're doing it a different way with a new thing. And about, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of people who've been doing this work for years, opening the consciousness, coordinating work, opening the field, getting us ready. You know, it's not... You know, Matt McCartney from Embercoom was saying the other day, what do you want me to do? Get, you know, can I help? It's like, if, this, if you know Embercoom, right, you, this, this, this work's built on your shoulders, mate, you know? It's, 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 you just carry on doing what you're doing and thank you. So, um, yeah, I'm just skipping over to Greta Thunberg saying, you know, we can't play by the rules. What a, what a sister she is, eh? <laughs> Fucking love her. She's awesome. <laughs> anyway, um, so... NVDA, Nonviolent Direct Action, it's been used a lot in the past and people tend to celebrate it when it's in the past and less so in the present. But, as, <laughs> you know what I mean? uh, but, but you know, bear in mind that we don't have, we're, to an extent we don't have GM crops in this country because of um, genetic snowball. Any of those folks here? Um, thank you. Uh, we, 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 yeah, thank you. Uh, we don't have, we have the right to roam because of mass trespass. We have trade unions because they're told pulled on martyrs. You know, we've probably got Seize the Day singing about it later. Have we? <laughs> Thank you. So, um, yeah, here we go. We've got Stuart. Let's, let's play Stuart um, this video about civil disobedience. What do you want to do when you grow up, darling? I want to be a mummy like my mummy. If they carry on, she won't be able to do that. It's as simple as that. continue to ignore it. It's undeniable what's happening. This is part of an attempt to start behaving as if it's an emergency in the hope of other people. So, non-violent civil disobedience. Oh. <laughs> it, it needs to be respectful. It, it's, we're not against somebody, you know. We're actually asserting our own collective will here. We, we would tend to focus on a capital city where the power is, it needs to be disruptive. It's, it's fun. Did they, who, who was there in April? I mean, it's fantastic, right? <laughs> I literally had the time of my life. Um, you know, I think that's why I don't mind dying, because, you know, peak experiences. Um, 
I'm going to talk more tomorrow about strategy and about different theories of change. So this is one aspect of our theory of change. I actually see it in more dimensions than this, and it's sort of interesting conversation about strategy and some of the other aspects to it that I think are just as important, uh, which includes p uh, bringing the family back together and healing the wounds, which is why the fact that the diversity panel is programmed at the same time as the strategy is a bit of a shame, to be honest. So... Um, uh, I don't know if anybody on the programme could organise changing that, to be honest, but um, sorry to land that one on you. Um, so Extinction Rebellion, you know, we, we, we formed in 2018. We were planning the launch this time last year. So, yeah, we launched, and uh, I have to say, it, I, I, I walk around here and all these symbols, and it still feels like a dream come true in the middle of a nightmare. I can't actually believe this thing's happening, but we are, there are 200 groups across the UK that are over, and there are, I think we're in 68 countries now. It's expanding all the time. One of the most important things about the expansion is doing it well, because in all honesty, we've got loads wrong in the UK uh, in terms of movement theory, and it's okay, we're all right, we're doing all right, but um, we're trying to backfill on that and make it better. And the way we do that is by being really clear on what's called our DNA, our movement DNA. And the wonderful Robin Boardman, who just came in, who runs the communities team, by the way, is 21. Him and fucking Frieda, I don't know if Frieda's probably here, who organises talks and training. There's some incredible young people in our movement. Uh, and there's some of us like me and Roger have got a bit more of a profile. It's, it's actually them that are running it, to be honest. And they need a lot more honouring and, 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 and acknowledging and respect for what they're doing um, behind the scenes. Um, it's Robin that walked out on that git from the, you know, love and respect <laughs> from Sky News. I don't know if you saw that interview. Uh, anyway, so so it's gone big. Um, there's a map with a lot of the groups on and um, we've, we've, we've done lots of rebellion. I'm skipping over here. We've got three demands. We have got a purpose here. It's tell the truth and act as if the truth's real, which means you have to cancel some of the madness like aviation expansion, HS2 and so on. We want net zero by 2025 and we want a citizens assembly on climate and ecological justice. And I'm afraid for time, I'm just going to have to skip through like literally all of that, like why we're saying 2025 and so on. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions about any of that afterwards. Um, why a citizens assembly is useful so I think I'm going to just say go to the DNA talk and get a lot more of this stuff that way uh, in, a, in a better way than I'm going to rush through um, but I'd like to finish on, on that video uh, Rod um, it, it's actually a video we made in, in, in January to pump us up for April, but it's still my favourite video out there because it's got Seize the Day playing in the background. and uh, so It just gives you a bit of a flavour of some of the fun that we've been having. Um, I'm just thinking about a couple more things to say. Yeah, some of the actions get planned nationally, and we obviously have to come together, and that means some people need to make some decisions, you know. Uh, there are decision-making structures in XR, all a little bit wobbly and shaky at times. Um, the, the feedback systems, uh, taking movement feedback is a mess a lot of the time, and apologies for that, and it's not for lack of trying uh, to get things right. But if you have any questions about how things are running in XR, just come and find me or Zion or anybody else um, who's on some of the national teams um, yeah and um, if you don't want to get arrested totally cool there's loads of other jobs that have to get done in XR literally for every arrest you need about 20 people doing regen doing media messaging uh, waiting do, doing the legal piece organising talks doing coordination work you know there's like a load of stuff you can do there's literally something for everybody in this movement you have a place in it you are very very welcome you're very needed and most of all it's the antidote to the despair to take action so let's have that um, video yeah, thank you.
you for the giving and all that you do. Thank you for the hand that pulled me through. Thanks for making it all okay. Thanks for taking a stand for me that way. Thanks for the golden years, for holding me through tears. Thanks for doing what I could not. Thanks for the good and all that we have got. The care, the way you share. Thank you for being there. Thanks for showing us what you see. Thank you for the love that you give to me. Thank you.